What's up, guys? This is Brave, and I'm back with another review of The Shy. This is season four, episode five. The episode is titled, um, The Spook Who Sat By The Door. Um, let's just go ahead and get into it. Oh, wait, before we get into it, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And let's just break it on down. Because this episode, oh, I have a lot of opinions. So we started the episode off with Duda strolling through the venue where he's going to have his event. You know, for some reason, on this show, they have this huge event that's about to happen, even though we still have not seen how the community has reacted to there not being police officers. But I digress. So he walks into the main room. Uh, Marcus is... Is it that Marcus? Jimba Daddy. I, I can't remember his name. is Marcus or Jimba Daddy, but y'all know who I'm talking about. So... He's telling Tracy to go over her speech again. But Duda is like, nah, she'll do fine. So then Marcus gives this speech about how, you know, this is us throwing the biggest event that our city has ever seen. Let's make Chicago proud. And of course, he goes on about how we need to get the Olympics. And that was pretty much that. That's not even important. Let's move on to Duda and Tracy. First of all, Tracy, what is this hairstyle? What is this haircut? I'm not feeling it. But let's just get into this conversation because, Tracy, I don't understand why you just rolled up on this man and asked him if he knew anything about the girl who got murdered off of whatever street. Listen, is he not the mayor now? He is not going to know every little incident that happens in Chicago, considering how rough they make Chicago seem on this show. Because the way people have been killed and murdered on this show... That right there is just like another death. Like, let's be honest. So the fact that she comes up to do that, she's like, you know, you know anything about this? And he's like, no, nah, I don't know nothing about that. And she's like, oh, well, I bet you know who did it. Girl, how would you know that? And then for the, for the simple fact that she sat up here talking about so she's sleeping with a gangbanger. I'm like, girl, you should have known that. You have been around the block for a while. Because when you really break this down... Wasn't Tracy, like, raped by that other old man who was on the show? But I'm like, okay, if you got raped back then, then you probably knew who the local gangbangers was, or you probably have been in the neighborhood and seen them. You should have been knew that dude I was a gangbanger, and he has moved his way up in ranking. Like, that is what is blowing my mind about this show, because you have a bunch of people who were around back in the day, or some old heads around the neighborhood, they would definitely know that dude I was the head of the gang. But we completely erased that storyline. But back to this, I fell out when he told her, listen, I can't change who I was. And I'm just like, when was this a was? Like, we never seen dude I officially leave that gang life, but whatever. So... He tells her, listen, you can either get with it or you can get the fuck on. I said, oh, <laughs> Tracy, he's putting the uh, hammer down. What are you going to do? So we then hop on over to Kevin. Now, he trying to text Gemma about how, you know, he just got his tux for the event tonight. Do she want to coordinate? She giving him one word answers. She is not trying to talk to Kevin. Oh, why not? Because she's with Jake. Y'all, I'm so pissed off by this storyline. Kevin is another character who has not seen any type of happiness throughout this entire show. Like, it doesn't make sense that this boy has been through this much trauma, and again, nobody sees it. All right, let's just go ahead and move on over to this conversation between Nina, I'm sorry, not Nina, Dre and Jada. When I tell you I'm so over Jada at this point, I get it, girl. You got cancer. But you sat up there and you told her to not tell Nina because she has to tell Emmett first. You told Emmett. Let this lady tell her wife what's going on because you already know that this situation is causing problems between the two of them. So I don't understand why you just won't let her tell her wife this. It doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, for you to tell Dre, oh yeah, I wrote out my will and I want you to carry it out. I ain't trying to be funny. But what did Jada even have? Like, girl, you don't own no property. You don't have no investments. Girl, whatever you have left, I'm pretty sure it's going to go to Emmett. You don't have any other children. What are we talking about? So then we hop on over to Jake and Gemma. And he's trying to tell her, like, 
you need to tell Kevin about us. You need to tell Kevin about us. And she's like, no, not yet. I'm not ready to tell him. I'm like, yeah, because you trifling. That's why you're not ready to tell him, girl. So Jake is like, well, if you won't tell him, then I will. Also, I hate the fact that he's like, he get on my nerves, but that's still my bro. Is he? Because you are literally choosing Gemma over Kevin. And I'm not even trying to be an asshole, but Gemma is not that girl. She's not. She's really not. All right, now let's hop on over to Nina and Dre. Because they're basically getting the house ready for when Keisha has this baby. Oh, I don't mean by decorations or anything like that. No, they got a little pool over there. They try to get towels and stuff together. Because she's doing a home water birth. Now, hear me out, y'all. I just feel like this is a lot considering this baby ain't even about to be hers. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> you doing a lot considering this baby is going right into somebody else's arms. But you know what? If this is their decision, fine. Especially since, of course, the show wants to bring awareness of how black women are not treated fairly when it comes to them having children in the hospital. So also in this conversation, we have Nina definitely speculating that something is going on with Dre, but Dre is like, no, I just went to the gym, but let's go hop in the shower together. I'm just like, ew, I don't, I don't want to know about Dre and Nina. I'm sorry. I just don't find them to be this attractive couple, especially considering how draining they are. Let's go ahead and move on. So we see Shad, he's ironing his clothes because what baby boy got coming up? A job interview. So Imani ends up coming up to him and is like, oh, well, you know, good luck on your interview. Do you have a tie to wear? He's like, nah, I ain't got one. So she's like, oh, well, here, I got this for Trig. You know, you can wear it. And he's like, oh, I don't know how to tie this. So when she reaches over to try to help him tie the tie, he, like, flinches back. And, like, at that point, she knew that he knew that she was trans. Now, here's the thing. I feel like this can be taken two ways, even though I know that it's absolutely wrong that he flinched at her and that he sat up here and acted like something was wrong with Imani when she was just trying to help him. But also, I feel like I wouldn't be mad if Sha flinched if Imani was even like just Trig's girlfriend who was born a woman like you're <clears throat> I understand a guy flinching back um because it's his homeboy's girlfriend like uh uh-uh, uh we not getting that close to each other just leave it where it's at you stay over there I stay over here because I don't want nothing to happen but of course in this situation it's because Imani is trans which is so annoying that we even have to go through this <laughs> Because I hate that, like, Imani cannot just be. I feel like the way that Imani's character is written... You know what? I'll just get to that later. I'll get to it later. So after that, we jump back over to Nina and Dre, and they're getting out of the shower or whatever, lotioning it up, and Dre is all in her phone. Keep in mind, we have no idea what was in her phone. It actually could have been work. We don't know. But again, Nina is suspicious. So we already know there's going to be a lot of mess happening with this couple. Do we want to watch it? No. But I guess we have to tolerate it. All right. So we hop on over to Imani. She is smoking a cigarette. And Trent comes home. And she's like, I want your friend out of here. And I want him out of here now. You need to do something about it. Here's my thing about Imani. And what I mean, like, her character can never just be. Like, I love seeing how nurturing she is to to Jake. I love seeing her being nurturing to Jake. I love to see when she's very uh, soft with Trig and, like, encouraging him. Or even when she's, like, telling him, like, no, we need to do something about the girls in the trap house. Last season, not this season. But... For some reason, I just feel like they are not utilizing her character well at all. Like, I hate the way she goes at Trig. It it makes it seem like everything is his fault. Like, Trinity dying, that was not Trig's fault. Should he try to help get those girls out the trap house? Yes. But girl, it's going to take some time. Like, it's funny how Imani wants everything to happen on her time when she says it. Or it's going to be some problems. And it's like, girl, I need you to calm down a little bit. 
So, same thing with Shot. I'm just like, why can't you just have, like, a normal conversation with Trig? Like, I hate the fact that, like, their conversation on this episode right here in this scene was just like, he clocked my tea and I want him to get out. And it's like, I would have loved for them to have, like, an actual conversation, like, Trig, like, I know that's your friend and all, but listen, I don't appreciate him making me feel this way because I've worked hard to be accepted as a trans woman. Like, I want her to be able to vocalize how she really feels and not just only give off attitude because Imani's character is way more than just attitude. Y'all get what I'm saying? Because literally in this scene, she goes off about how Shad not about to be sitting up in her house, eating her food, being disrespectful to her, and all this stuff. And I'm just like, but technically, he hasn't exactly disrespected you. He flinched back, but he didn't say anything that was negative. He didn't do anything, unless there are things that are happening that this show, unfortunately, did not write in for us to see. But let me know what y'all thought about that. So, after that, we hop on over to Keisha. Now, she is over here finding her old baby book. And, you know, of course, it has, like, the pictures of when she was a baby. Nina comes down there, and she's like, oh, I'm not going to get one of these for this baby, huh? No, you're not. Why would you even think of that, Keisha? Like, (laughs) I'm sorry, but I I hate, I hate the way they are trying to make it seem like she really want to keep this baby. Like, why would she want to keep a rapist's baby? Let, please let me know, because it doesn't make sense. The way Keisha was, season one, season two, no, I don't see it for this Keisha. So after that, we see this moment with Jada and Emmett. And Emmett is like, you know, mom, we got to get you better because I need you. I can't, you know, he can't really continue on because all he has is his mom. Like, yeah, he has Darnell. But at the same time, Darnell was so iffy when he was younger. Their relationship relationship is okay, but it still ain't as solid as, as solid as it should be. Jeez, I'm talking so fast. Um, but one thing that I will say that I appreciated in this conversation was the fact that Jada is like, I don't need you to give me a big house. Please know that I'm proud of you where you are right now. You're a business owner. You're doing great things, uh, Emmett. And I'm just like, oh, look at that reassurance. But real life, I don't need Jada's character to die because I want her to at least get a little bit of happiness out of all the turmoil that they have given her. All right, so after that, we actually see a scene with Keisha. She's at work and she's talking to a new guy. Now, he is a new hire and he's just trying to have like small talk with her about, you know, how she goes to the back sometimes to tell people that she'll go look in the back for stuff. And she's like, no, I don't go back there for that. I'll go back there so I can get a little break. I can't knock her because I definitely used to do that when I worked retail. Be pretending like I'm going to look for something in the back when knowing damn well I'm going to sit my ass down somewhere. But anyways, (laughs) I am so happy that Keisha is actually meeting someone who is her age because I'm okay. I get that her friends kind of turn their back on her, but I'm like, y'all can't give her not a one friend that was solid. Not one. So I like that she has a male interest now because as much as I like her with Emmett, Emmett is married to Tiff. So I can just go ahead and let that go. But this new guy, I like him. So we hop on over to Rashad. I keep calling him Rashad, but I guess it's just Shad and his little job interview or whatever. So he come up in there. He try to be respectful to the man. The man happens to know some of his family members. I was like, okay, cool. This is going well. Until that man looked at that resume it was like 2002 was the last time you worked at Radio Shack. I said, baby, Radio Shack ain't been in business in who knows how long, first of all. How long was he in jail? You mean to tell me he was in jail for like 18 years? 18 years? Something like that? Oh, hell no. Nah. So, <laughs> it's funny to me, though, that he is working. Well, he's trying to get a job, you know, at some company where he's trying to like work his way up, you know. And unfortunately, with the way the prison system is and how society treats people who have been in jail, it's hard for him to get a job. And this man is like, I can give your resume to my boss, but I don't make that final decision. Now, what's crazy to me, though, is that you have Trig, 
who's practically Duda's right hand man when it comes to this uh, community active. What are they? The community activators. What are they? The community activists. Whatever they want to be. So him and Tracy, he can't get no job down there with you. Dude, I just gave her $5 million. You mean to tell me all these people are still volunteers? Ain't no way these people should still be volunteers when now y'all have created a whole group. You have Tracy speaking at places about how her rock organization is doing all this stuff for the community and how Chicago is going to police itself. So I'm not understanding how Tree couldn't get him a job down there, regardless of his background. So, after the interview goes bad, you know, Shot has an attitude. He ready to go get some drinks. And it was weird to me that Trig was in there and, like, waiting on him. And I'm just like, shouldn't you be waiting in the car? Nobody actually goes into, like, the warehouse where somebody has an interview to wait for them. But I digress. So, we hop back over to Keisha. And I think this guy's name is Christian. Or at least that's what my closed caption is saying. So... She's outside talking to the guy. He is up sharing his candy with her. And she asks him, like, oh, why are you working here? And he's like, well, you know, I got bills. And I once had a scholarship. But that fell through when I uh, got hurt. So, you know, now I'm working here. And she's like, oh, well, I, I know that life because I have a very similar story. And he's like, yeah, I know. But I'm sorry that you, I'm sorry that, that happened to you. And I'm glad that you made made it through. I was like, oh, okay. But I can tell how, like, fearful um, Keisha was when he was like, oh, yeah, I know your story. Because, like, what happened to her is so traumatic. You wouldn't want nobody to know that story. You know what I mean? But... I really think that she has a shot with this guy. He seems to have a good head on his shoulders. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why Keisha is still working so close to her due date. I need for somebody to let me know why Keisha, who hasn't worked ever on this show, has never had a job before, is working this close to her due date. But we gonna get there. Because when they went back in, um, you know, back into work, she started having like contractions, but she's still thinking that these are Braxton Hicks. And I'm like, nah, uh baby, you about to have that baby. So we hop on over to Jada and she's puking and Sway is right by her side. And he ends up telling her that he loves her. Now I'm like, okay, I'm all for Jada finding love and I'm okay with it being with Sway. But my whole thing is, I understand that she has cancer, but every time we see her, I do not want to see her throwing up in a bucket or in a toilet. I promise you, I I just don't want to see it. I don't want to see it, and everybody who has gone through cancer and chemo, like, yes, that is a part of the process, but there are also other things that happen when you go through chemo, besides just throwing up. All right, so we actually see the boys getting ready for this gala or whatever that, um... Mr. Perry is having and you already know the boys look really really nice Kevin always looks great uh when he gets dressed in a little suit or whatever Jake looks really nice so this is where we see that Imani is Jake's chaperone for this event now who was Kevin's chaperone y'all y'all tell me who who Kevin came with oh yeah by himself because where was his parents Oh, yeah, waiting for Keisha to del- deliver that baby. I mean, I haven't, we haven't talked about it yet because that scene hasn't come up. But my point still remains. Kevin is just out here in these streets all alone. The man ain't never got nobody to stand right by his side. I don't understand that. Hell, Dre could have went over there to uh, be sh- the chaperone for Kevin. What else was Dre doing? Hell, actually, no, it could have been Nina because she was annoying everybody when Keisha had that baby. So, um, one thing I will point out, what the hell did Imani have on? Like, I'm tired of them giving Imani these terrible outfits, these terrible hairdos. Like, we need to step it up for Imani. So, we get to the gala, and I mean, it looks really nice. You know, Duda is looking real sharp in his suit. He over here shaking hands, kissing babies, and all of that. Okay, we're not kissing babies, but y'all know what I mean. And next thing you know, he goes and talks to all these kids who are the youth ambassadors. So you have Jake, Kevin, Gemma, and some other kids we ain't never seen. So he's just telling them to have a good time, go talk to the people. 
and eat as much as they want. So after he gives his speech or whatever, we hear Jake say, fuck that dude. And I'm just like, yeah, I know you don't really like dude or whatever, but you didn't have to show up if you don't like that man like that. Just saying. But anyways, um, so Gemma says, come on, right? Keep in mind, she's standing next to Jake. She ain't standing next to Kevin. Her and Jake just mosey on off. They just walk the hell off and leave Kevin there looking stupid. I'm so mad because they are literally playing in this man's face. They are playing in my boy Kevin's face. So we then see Keisha. She is still at work trying to help these customers and she is having these contractions, okay? I think that at some point she starts to like keep the track of the time to see how far apart they were. But I'm just like, girl, you should have went home. I mean, I know if it was me, I would have gone home, okay? All right, so then we hop right, right on back to the kids. And Kevin is just like walking around looking for Gemma. And he finally finds her. And she's just like, oh, are you having fun? He's like, not really. Of course he ain't having fun because you're not with him. We already know that at this point he wants to make things right with Gemma. And she's completely ignoring him. And she responded with, oh, yeah, because I know these aren't your types of things to do. I'm sorry. So you mean to tell me this is your type of event? Like, it really bothered me that she said that because at the end of the day, you think Jake ass want to be here, too? Because last time I checked, he wanted to go home as well. So what do you, why are you just trying to come at Kevin? Like, she is really trying to find a way to weasel her way out of this relationship instead of being up front. Like, I feel like her escape was going to be like, you know what, Kevin? I just feel like we're just so different. And it's just like, no, you acting like Kevin has changed. Kevin is the same person. You just wanted to be with his best friend. So at this point though, y'all, we see that Jake, he's over there talking to some other girl who's like a youth ambassador. Oh, now Gemma is over here upset. She's mad. Keep in mind, she's standing right next to Kevin. And then next thing you know, she storms her way over to Jake and is like, are you trying to make me jealous? And he's like, is it working? So she's like, you already know it is, basically. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? You are really about to sit up here in Kevin's face and do him like this. You are trifling. And what's funny, though, is that you out here chasing after Jake. And Jake really don't give a damn about you, to be honest. Because if he can go sit up there and lollygag in some other girl's face, girl, Jake is not going to treat you right. All right, now let's move on to Keisha having this baby. So, <laughs> um, we see them filling up the pool in the living room. And I'm just like, how y'all get all that water out? I'm just curious. You like, how do you dump the water? But you know what? I don't know those types of things. If anybody knows, let me know in the comments. So, um, they're getting ready. You have Dre on the phone and she's talking to the midwife or the doula. I don't know who she was on the phone with, you know, basically telling her like, Keisha's about to have this baby. Her contractions are five minutes apart. And then we have no nothing Nina over there just talking about, so we need to go to the hospital. She needs to have this baby in the hospital. I don't know if Keisha's going to make it through. Blah, blah, blah. Then you have uh, Keisha. She is like clinging onto the wall because the contractions is coming. Now, baby, when Octavia tried to come through with them intentions, I fell the hell out because she's like, all right, let me, let me go ahead and get these intentions. Let me read these intentions to y'all because me and Keisha came up with them. We want to bring this baby into this world naturally in a water birth, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, girl, this ain't the time. <laughs> this is just not the time. Also, it was very interesting that they had a house full of people. Well, not people, but they had a house full of women to be there to support um, Keisha. I thought that was actually a pretty great idea. Um, but it's just interesting because she's not keeping that baby. Unless she tried to take the baby back from Octavia, which I hope that she don't. But let's go ahead and move on. So we hop back over to the gala and we have Rose. I mean, not Rose. Rosalyn and what's this man named Duda? They're dancing on the dance floor, right? But Rose is like, listen, I need a position. Like, it's cool to be Duda's wife, but at the same time, baby girl needs some job security, and she needs to be in the room and in the meetings with him, basically. And he literally said, bitch, please. I said, oh, 
the disrespect. Now, you done told Rosalind, bitch, please. You done told Tracy, get the fuck on. I'm like, damn, you do not like these women like that. So, of course, that is when Rosalind is like, well, you know what? If you don't want to give me a position, then I'm going to divorce your ass. And that ain't going to look good. All right. So then we hop back over to Keisha in labor. All right. Enough of that. Now let's get into this Trig and Shaw conversation because Trig, I just feel like that man get stuck between a rock and a hard place all the time, unnecessarily, because Shaw is basically telling him like, listen, I basically did a bid for you. And now Trig is saying, well, no, I was just a lookout. Um, y'all kind of was doing y'all own thing. So Shot is like, well, I didn't tell nobody. You know what I mean? I didn't tell on you. So, of course, Trig is like, okay, yeah, you got a point there. But he has to then let him know that Imani wants him out of the house, right? Now, I will say this. Trig, you kind of did this at a bad time. Like, I get Imani wants him out, but you just, you were just there where he went through this interview process. And he already down on his luck. He already feeling some type of way. So for you to try to throw him out right now, yeah, he's going to he's gonna be all of his feelings. So once, you know, Trig is like, well, Imani wants you out, you know, we have shot. He's like, oh, so you going to choose that thing over me? I was like, whoa, 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 uh, shot. You taking this too far. Don't be disrespectful. Don't be rude. Like. I don't like where you're going with this. So then they get into this argument about Imani not being a woman and all this stuff. And I can't even lie. Like, I'm surprised that this is the first time that this conversation has come up. Because considering how many people Trig has been around, as many, as many people Trig has ran up on and done all this stuff to, I'm surprised that more people did not try to diss him for being with Imani or try to call him out or like try to disrespect Imani. You get what I'm saying? Like, I'm surprised that Nook didn't try to disrespect Imani in her face because as trifling as he is, I feel like he's definitely the type to try to do that. You know what I'm saying? So they ended up, you know, cussing each other out, storming off. So we could already tell that that friendship is pretty much done, which sucks. But, I mean, all friendships ain't meant to last. All right, so we finally hear Tracy. She is saying her little speech about the Chicago kids. Oh, I'm sorry, what is it? Re- remembering our Chicago kids. I think that's the name of her organization, Rock or whatever. And I'm just like, how did Tracy become a community leader? Somebody please let me know that. But anyways, um, her little speech was cute or whatever, but... I just, like, I don't understand what's the whole thing about the Olympics. Like, I need to see how the city is reacting. I need to see if the city is, like, robbing people and shooting people up. Like, I need to see Trig and Tracy doing more work than talking. Y'all know what I'm saying? So, during her speech, because this is the important stuff, you have Jake storming out and Gemma is chasing after him. And he's like, I ain't trying to be here no more because I ain't trying to be nobody charity case and blah, blah, blah. Because he feels like he's only there because he got his ass beat by the cops. Now, I'm like, yeah, that is a factor. But also, you're supposed to be Duda's like son or foster child, whatever you are to him. So, of course, they were going to expect for you to be there to show face. So, he's like, I'm trying to leave or whatever. And she's like, oh, well... You want to get out of here? And we already know where she was trying to go with that. Um, And I'm just like, it's so funny how Gemma is moving. Like, Gemma is so trifling. Like, in this situation, I feel like Jake is still trying to play it cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not trying to let Kevin think anything. Like, if he if he walks the other way, it's fine. But with Gemma chasing after him, yeah, that's looking real suspicious, girl. Also, what threw me off was the fact that he went on about how he don't belong there, right? And how the reason why they invited him was because of the whole police incident. And then he further goes into the fact that why isn't she telling people about them? Because, nigga, she's still with Kevin. Why the fuck do you think that Jimmy is going to be running around the city telling all her friends and the whole damn school that she messing around with you? 
she trying to keep this on the hush, I guess, but she doing a terrible job at it. Like, I'm so confused as to why he thought that she was going to start telling people that they were together. When it's really like, because she's still with Kevin. Are you kidding me? And then for this conversation to go further with Jake talking about so why you haven't introduced me to your dad as your boyfriend or whatever. Because why would she? Her dad knows that she's dating Kevin. Make this conversation make sense. And also, I just want to call Jim out on her lie when um, Jake is like, oh, Kevin looks better on your arm or whatever. And she's like, well, Kevin is the one who approached me and you didn't. Last time I checked, he was never checking for you to begin with. Like, honestly, Jake thought that you was some rude, bougie black girl. And he still think that about you. And then Kevin, on the other hand, you were kind of chasing after Kevin. Are we forgetting this, sweetheart? So, we end up seeing Kevin searching around this whole damn building, the whole damn venue for Gemma. I want to assume just Gemma. I don't think he was really searching for Jake. He just happened to find Jake and Gemma kissing in a stairwell or whatever. And once he kind of like, he was stuck for a moment because baby boy is in shock. So, then once he got out of the state of shock, he ended up... um, what did he end up doing? Oh, he took like a step back and they heard his his foot move. And that's when they both looked up. And you have Jimmy like, Kevin, wait. And then Kevin, he, he's gone. Like he left. And Gemma, she ends up staying with Jake because Jake grabbed her arm. And I'm like, ooh, girl, you was a trifling one. Payback is going to come back and get you because Kevin deserved better. Okay. Now, I just want Kevin to meet a nice girl and have a good old time. This is why I wanted him to be with Maisha. Because I'm so mad that the show literally let this boy have chemistry with Maisha and then passed him, I mean, passed Maisha to his homeboy because his homeboy was fat. Let's call a thing a thing. That's exactly what the show did. So we do get to see a glimpse of Duda's speech. And I mean, it was cool or whatever. Um, I do like the fact that he said people should root for black people just because not because we're winning the Olympics and not because of uh, sports and entertainment. I'm all for that. Um, I just have one question. When he proposed that racially equitable bid for the Olympics, we didn't hear what that meant. And I have a problem with that because I really want to know what he was talking about. Now, while all this is happening, we see poor Kevin is having a whole moment. Baby boy is running through the hallways, wiping his face, wiping his tears away because he just saw his best friend kiss his girlfriend. A mess. So let's hop on over to Tracy and Imani in this conversation. Imani walks up and is like, oh, well, you had a great speech or whatever. And Tracy is like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Now here comes Imani talking about some, well, how come you ain't mentioned the girls in the trap house? Bitch, do it sound like that would fit into the conversation? Like, I'm not even trying to be funny, but why would Tracy bring up how some girls are in a trap house and people are trying to help get them out, but ain't nobody really doing nothing? Like, why would she mention that when they're trying to get the Olympics to come to Chicago? That is not what this was about, Imani. But that's my thing about Imani, though. Because she wants things to happen on her time when she wants it to happen. And it's like, but let's be realistic. There is a such thing as a time and a place. And that was not the time or the place to bring up the girls in that trap house. So after she ends up leaving, Duda walks up and he basically invites Tracy to come upstairs with him up to the uh, roof. Now, after she walks away, because she says she's going to shake a few other hands and then maybe she'll come up, he ends up running into Jimmy's daddy. And Jimmy's daddy is like, Man, you need to watch yourself. And he's basically saying this every time he's around Tracy because he know and Tracy ain't right. Hell, Duda ain't either. But <laughs> here we go with Duda telling him that he don't owe him shit. I'm just like, Damn. You are just cutting people off left and right, okay? Damn, dude, I. So, after that, we see Kevin. He is getting in his Uber. And you can already tell that something has switched in Kevin. And I'm just like, no, our sweet Kevin is about to change into an asshole. But I'm kind of ready for it. (laughs) So, next we have a scene with Emmett. 
and he's at his home and you know his dad is there and he's just talking about how like you know he spent some time with his mom uh, that day and you already know how his dad is he just trying to make a funny moment he's like oh did she ask about me or something like that so then Emmett kind of storms off because he's all of his feelings and his emotions because of what's going on with his mom and his dad is like what's wrong like what's going on so what happens is Emmett goes into the bathroom now remember we saw that on the first episode where he was like standing in the bathroom looked like he was crying and we thought it was probably over Tiff nope it is actually over Jada so Darnell he actually stands there at the bathroom door like I'm not leaving until you tell me what's going on because like this is definitely not like Emmett at all so Emmett finally opens up the door and is like she's sick and I can't lose her now he did say that and I'm hoping that Darnell caught on that it was to Jada because the way he said it hell it could have been Jada or Tiff but him breaking down like that oh my god I did cry I can't lie I cried and I will say that Jacob Lattimore he is a very good actor like at first when I first saw him on um the first season I was like eh he alright but I see he has really strengthened it up so we actually go back to Keisha and that baby so she has the baby and of course what happens is they take the baby from Keisha and then they give the baby directly to Octavia because that is now her child and you can see that Keisha is feeling some type of way but I hope that she realizes that this is the best decision for her like I want her to have children and have a happy life but at the same time I do not think that she has to keep that baby that is by that crazy man. Let Octavia deal with that because we don't know what that man's habits were, his terrible behaviors. No, absolutely not. Let Octavia deal with that. So let's just hop on over to that last scene. And of course, that is with Duda. He is looking out on the city. And of course, city lights look beautiful. But he ends up turning around and he has like this look on his face like if he's kind of like happy to see the person and then his face changes because I think that he actually looked in two different directions because I feel like he saw somebody that he knew and then the other thing kind of shocked him because next thing you know we see a hand on a gun and they shoot Duda in the abdomen area and baby boy is laid out on the ground and that is where we actually ended this episode Um, Let me know what you guys thought about this episode. Again, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And I will talk to you guys in the next review. Bye, guys.